Mental health can affect anyone in powerful and sometimes severe ways. But how much of this can be used to explain the terrible actions of David Katz? It was in August of 2018 that he would do the unthinkable and attempt to end the lives of a dozen other gamers. But what was the motive behind his actions? What struggles did David conceal from others? And what lay behind his terrible history? This case is eye-opening to say the least. It contains a myriad of red flags and concerning clues which all led to tragedy, and argues the importance of mental health and how to deal with it. Hey there folks, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the case of David Katz. And just to let you know before we begin, but I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that's your sort of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So grab yourself a coffee, buckle up, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of David Katz. Welcome back to America, folks. Today we're zoning in on the state of Maryland, and more specifically, the state of Baltimore. Hard to believe, but in 1752, Baltimore had just 27 homes, a church, and two taverns. But fast forward a little over 270 years, and it now holds a population of roughly 600,000 residents. Once a predominantly industrial town with an economic base focused on steel processing, shipping, and auto manufacturing, the city now relies on a low-wage service economy, which accounts for 31% of jobs in the city. Nowadays, shipping cargo and tourism are significant players in Baltimore's economy, and roughly $53 billion of cargo move through its shipping ports every year. And as for tourism, Baltimore's rich history makes this a popular destination for tourists, with more than 25 million visitors per year. However, there's a disturbing side to Baltimore too. Some of you may know it for Leakin Park, an area infamous for finding dead bodies. And in fact, since 1946, a total of 79 bodies have been found around its grounds. Most of these were from one-off homicides, however, some of the bodies were from the spree killer Reginald Oates. Now, Leakin Park also borders on some of Baltimore's roughest neighborhoods, which probably strongly influences the number of homicides in the area. But today's story doesn't begin or end in a place of poverty, and in fact, it's actually quite the opposite. Miles away from the cold and dangerous streets around Leakin Park, we find the Katz family, comprising of Mother Elizabeth, Father Richard, and their two sons, Brandon and David. Their eldest son, Brandon, was born in March of 1990, and his younger brother David followed suit almost four years later. Born on December the 22nd, 1993, David entered this world into an affluent and highly educated family. His father, Richard, was a NASA engineer, and his mother Elizabeth was a toxicologist for the FDA, also known as the US Food and Drug Administration. And just a heads up, but this fact becomes extremely vital to our story later. Despite their promising beginning, Brandon's and David's childhoods were rocky to say the least. It was in the year 2006, when David was only 12 years old, that his parents decided to divorce. Understandably, this devastated both him and his brother Brandon, and moving forward, the two split their time between their parents. The brothers attended Hammond High School in Columbia, found southwest of Baltimore. And while here, classmates recognized David as a shy and sometimes antisocial kid. He stuck to himself, was quiet, and was heavily into video games. And that final point is rather crucial to highlight, as moving forward, David spent most of his time in his room playing competitive sports video games, namely Madden NFL. The Madden series is an American football video game based on the Nation Football League, developed by EA Sports. And with this game being Madden, a new edition of the game comes out every year. David graduated from Hammond High School in 2011, and fast forward three years to 2014, he enrolled in the University of Maryland to major in environmental science and technology. But David wasn't necessarily interested in education or work, and instead he dived deeper into the world of the internet, spending all of his time on video games. His dedication eventually paid off, and he became very good at playing Madden, and by June of 2016, he started competing in professional competitive games against other players. Taking the gaming name Bread, Sliced Bread, or Ravens Champ, he joined the Buffalo Bills Madden 17 Series Championship, and eventually won. Initially seen as an underdog and the seventh seed, David began to turn heads when he annihilated his opponents in game, and gained further attention with his cocky interviews. You, you came in here today, you traveled up from Maryland, and now you get a chance to go into the semifinals. Uh, you, feel, you have to feel pretty good about it. You came in as a seventh seed and you just knocked off the two seed and you did it pretty convincingly. 
Um, yeah, I don't think of myself as a seven seed. I think personally, I'm one of the better players, um, and I like to let my game prove that. All right, Dave, congratulations. We'll see you in the next round. And guys, Larry, Zach, we'll go back upstairs to you guys. This appeared to be David's lucky weekend. He went on to win the Buffalo Bills Madden Championship, landing him a cool $10,000 in the process. He's necessary. He's oh! oh! Brandon Cooks, he's got the speed. Does he have enough juice? Last play of the game. Oh, my goodness. Touchdown, the young man from Columbia, Maryland. The last play of the game, and he gets it done. It's a touchdown. A long house call there. I am speechless. And that is the ball game. Well, along with the money that you're getting, we're also, we've got something else for you in the club series. Your Madden jersey, there you go. Way to go, Bread. Coming out on top in the championship. Number seven seed taking out the number one seed in the final. Congratulations, Larry, Zach, up to you. Congr what a day in Buffalo. And although he wouldn't win the next one, in April of 2017, David Katz went on to represent the Buffalo Bills at the Madden 17 Club Series Championship, which is a very prestigious duty for a gamer no matter how you view it. David Katz was in a very exciting moment of his life, and despite falling back on his education, he was making great wins, making good money, and earning a good reputation in his hobby. Now, it's every gamer's dream to make a career out of video games, but despite his rising fame, there were many challenging aspects to David's life, and many of them stemmed back to his early childhood. Police records show that between 1993 and 2009, the first 16 years of David's life, 26 calls were made to the police from his family home. No one is entirely sure what these calls were for, but the vast majority are categorized under domestic disputes and mental illness, and many of these calls were during the time David was just a child. And this is probably the best time to address David's mental health, because it was really not good. David was known to have a myriad of mental health issues, starting at the age of nine. By the time David was 12 years old, he'd seen multiple psychiatrists and had been prescribed several psychiatric drugs, including antipsychotics and antidepressants. Now, this was one of the many reasons David's parents had divorced, as the two constantly argued about what was best for their children. Richard claimed that Elizabeth, a toxicologist for the FDA, was obsessed with using mental health professionals and psychiatric drugs to perform the work that parents should naturally do. And whether Richard's claims were valid or not, there is no denying that David was on strong medication from an extremely young age, and his mental health seemed to be very problematic throughout his teenage years. Despite his father's concerns, David was prescribed Abilify, an antipsychotic drug primarily used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He was also prescribed Prozac, an antidepressant under the SSRI umbrella. And to add to this, there are also unconformed reports to say that he was prescribed another antidepressant called Lexapro. After allegedly experiencing a psychiatric crisis, Elizabeth took David to see a range of therapists, psychiatrists, and social workers. And in one instance, David had to be handcuffed by police after locking himself in his mother's car to avoid going to a mental health appointment with her. David's story gets worse and worse. In 2007, and at the age of 14, David was admitted to Shepherd Pratt Psychiatric Hospital, where he was administered a higher dosage of antidepressants. This was only one of four known care facilities that David attended around the same year. And since then, one of them has recently been under investigation for sexual abuse of their adolescent patients. By now, David's parents had divorced, and he was splitting his time between his mother's and his father's homes. Saying that, he did have a favourite parent, and he clearly hated spending any time with his mother. She had twice packed all of his clothes into a suitcase and told him to get out of the house, and one of those occasions was on Mother's Day in 2007. David was also enrolled into a wilderness treatment programme for troubled teenagers for several months, and allegedly, his mother had enrolled him into the facility without first securing permission from the court. On December the 22nd, 2009, David wrote a letter to the judge reviewing his own parents' ongoing custody battle, and in this letter he said, Dear Judge, today is my birthday and I'm turning 16 years old. I live with my mum and have been wanting to live with my dad. My mum is pretty crazy. She called the police on me about 20 times for pretty much nothing, like coming home a little late or something. She also gets drunk and starts yelling at me and poking me and doesn't leave me alone. She has hit me before, and always takes my stuff because she feels like it. She has twice sent me to mental hospitals, and once to a wilderness therapy program for no significant reason. 
I also can never talk to her because I hate her more than anything in the world, and she would probably yell at me. She also lies a lot. As David reached adulthood, the frequency in which he sought medical attention dropped quite drastically. Whether this was because he had control over his own life or not, we don't actually know, but concerning signs still existed throughout his day-to-day -day schedule. David would go days without bathing. He often played video games such as Madden until 4am on school nights, and he often walked around the house in circles. To add to this, David was further diagnosed with dysthymia, which is a persistent depressive disorder. To make this more relatable, it's basically major depressive disorder, but with longer lasting symptoms. And in conjunction with this, he was also diagnosed with oppositional defined disorder. ODD is defined as a pattern of angry and irritable moods, coupled with argumentative and defined behaviour. This behaviour is usually targeted towards peers, teachers, authority figures, and of course, in this case, parents. Moving forward, David withdrew himself from the rest of the real world. He spent almost all of his time online, had almost no physical friends, and began to fail at school. By the time he was competing in Madden tournaments, he was living alone in a condo in Baltimore. And although he was enrolled in university, he wasn't actually registered for any classes that year. David had earned the reputation as a strong, professional Madden player, but many other players saw him as socially awkward, strange, and rude. As seen in many of his clips, he never made eye contact with other players, and would often refuse to shake their hands after a win or a loss. You are not going to see much emotion from our guy Brett. This dude is a man David Catch keeps to himself. He's a man of business. He's not here for the experience and to go out, this, that, and the third. He's not here to make friends. He's all business. He's focused, and to even get him to open up to talk to you about anything, it's, it's like pulling teeth, man. Now, David was clearly an awkward guy, and although some people knew of his aggressive behavioural issues, no one was very apprehensive about being in his presence. But in August of 2018, that would all change, and excluding those that lost their lives, he would forever change the lives of dozens of people forever. August 26th, 2018. The time was 1.30pm. It was a Sunday, and Florida was enjoying another laid-back weekend in the humid heat. Families were taken to the malls to keep cool, while others remained in their homes under their aircon. And roughly 150 of those in the city of Jacksonville were spending their weekend at the Good Luck Have Fun Gaming Bar, located in the Jacksonville Landing Indoor Marketplace. A Madden NFL 19 tournament was being hosted here, and many of those who were particularly good at the game had been invited. And of course, this included Brett, also known as David Katz. The event had spanned over the weekend, beginning on Saturday, with the final schedule to take place on the Sunday evening. David had comfortably made his way through several wins on Saturday, but now Sunday was here, the games were getting more serious and much more harder. Now, unfortunately, luck was not on his side today, as shortly before 1pm, David Katz was knocked out of the tournament by his opponent, Elijah Clayton. David was furious, and refused to shake Elijah's hand after being knocked out, and this wasn't just because he was defeated by him, but because David and Elijah had a very long and toxic history. Now, Elijah often picked on David for his social awkwardness, and seemed to intentionally jeopardise David's work whenever possible. In fact, David had recently authored a book to teach others how to get better at Madden, and after releasing this book, Elijah posted it online for everyone to read without buying. In a recent tournament, Elijah and David ordered a taxi back to the airport, but when the cab arrived, Elijah slammed the door on David's face, and then left without him. And now, after all of this bad blood, David had been knocked out of the tournament by the man he despised, and the consequences would be both irrational and severe. Got a lot of good games going on. It's a today. lot. It's, it's, it's gonna be hard yeah. to get them on stream. It's, it's not a, a lot. Yeah, it's not a tough out. After storming out of the Good Luck Have Fun bar, David headed around Chicago Pizza. While there, he took his sunglasses off and left them on the side of the table before reaching into his Baltimore Ravens backpack. Storming back into the bar, he took position near the other players, pulled out a 45 caliber handgun from his bag, and dropped the bag on the floor. The tournament was still in full swing, with several players in the middle of the match, and to add to this, the entire thing was being livestreamed on Twitch and several other platforms. David aimed his gun at Elijah Clayton, and it just so happened that the livestream camera was focused on him this very moment. 
Just seconds before being shot, the laser sight on David's gun can be seen hovering over his chest. And just as the camera pans back to the game, David pulled the trigger. Elijah was shot in the chest, forehead, and right eye three times, killing him instantly in his chair. David then turned on to 12 other victims, which included 27-year-old Taylor Robertson. Taylor was shot from behind as he ran away. Sadly, he was killed in the process. And just 20 seconds after firing his first shot, David turned the gun on himself. Ten others had been shot before David took his own life, with an eleventh victim injuring himself from running away. And all of this had been captured live on stream. It seems that David's motive was made out of rage. Elijah had long frustrated him, and after losing to him, he couldn't handle it anymore. Couple this with ODD, amongst other issues, and it seems fairly likely. But this doesn't explain why he purchased two guns shortly before the tournament, or why he bought them with him. So perhaps there was some sort of premeditation involved. Gunfire was first reported on social media at 1.34pm, and only two minutes later, first responders arrived at the bar, and what they found was a crime scene full of terror. The firefighters' union had been training in the area when victims had run up to them for help. They could help secure the scene very quickly with the assistance of officers. And due to the bar's location, the Coast Guard was also called in to sweep the surrounding waterways. Authorities were able to storm the main room of the Good Luck Have Fun bar around 40 minutes after the attack, and there they found David, Elijah, and Taylor dead at the scene. David's body count could have been much higher, but thankfully, 10 of his 12 victims survived the attack. Even still, two innocent lives had been lost in the process, and now two families, along with countless friends and fans, would now have to grieve for their loss. Taylor Robertson, also known as Spot Me Please, was born on November the 26th, 1990. He was a professional NFL player from Bollard, West Virginia. Taylor was a 2009 graduate of James Monroe High School, was a standout athlete at school, and Athlete of the Year in his senior year. He was also an accountant and credit analyst working for First Community Bank. Elijah Clayton, also known as True Boy, was born on June the 19th, 1996. He too was a professional player from Woodlands Hill, California. He attended Calabasas High School and played for their football team in his younger years. Tragically, he decided to attend the event very last minute, as up until the day before, he had no plans to go. Bringing modern technology to the discussion, but one aspect of the investigation that I found to be very fascinating was Jacksonville Police Department's 3D modeling. This video was created using thousands of images, stitched together to accurately portray a virtual model of the crime scene. After entering the building, and then panning around the pizza restaurant, you can see the area in which David had taken his own life. To the left and down the hallway is where he had previously shot Elijah. Sadly, this model captures how chaotic the scene was after. With David Katz dead, there would obviously be no trial or court proceedings for the individual, but many lawsuits erupted in the wake of his destructive path. The aftermath of this story is, unfortunately, very messy and confusing, as nobody actually knew about David's mental health issues until after it was all too late, and of course, many questions followed. It turns out that, despite all of his former mental health problems, David had legally purchased a couple of handguns just two weeks before the shooting from a shop in Maryland. And that was just the tip of the iceberg, because what followed was the revelation of his long and complicated history with antipsychotics, antidepressants, and his mother. Summarising what we discussed earlier, but David had been diagnosed with dysthemia and oppositional disorder, was previously on a wide range of antidepressants and antipsychotics, had witnessed a traumatic divorce between his parents, had a very problematic relationship with his mother, and had attended more than several mental health institutions. And arguably, but one of the most concerning details is how young David was when he began to take antidepressants and antipsychotics. He was only 13 at the time, which was a time when he had a lot of physical and mental development ahead of him. The use of antidepressants is not usually recommended in children and young people under the age of 18, and there are dozens of studies that even argue adverse effects on patients between 18 to 24 years old. David was 5 and 11 years younger than these recommendations, respectively and it's essential to address the bias in his life too. David's mother was a toxicologist working for the US Food and Drug Administration, and to add to this, she was a strong advocate for the use of antidepressants and antipsychotics. Now, this isn't necessarily a wrong opinion to have, but arguably, her strong bias led her to enforce the use of drugs on her son when he didn't necessarily need them. Bearing in mind that David's father was firmly against the use of drugs, 
and even argued that therapy would have been a much safer method. Several other red flags come to mind too. We can't forget that Elizabeth enrolled her son in healthcare facilities without first securing permission of the court. And in addition to this, she denied David's father visitation rights. To add to this was David's letter to the judge, which was a cry for help. David believed that his mother was abusive, a liar, and often unnecessarily called the police on him. And while exaggeration may be at play to David's letter, there is likely some form of truth behind it. Now, honestly, I wish I could stop there but I think the next part of this story is what surprised me the most. In October 2004, the FDA, which is Elizabeth's employer, ordered a black box warning for SSRI antidepressants for anyone under the age of 18, because of the risk it brings to suicidal thoughts. Just two years later, when David was 13 years old, he was prescribed Lexapro, which was listed as an antidepressant under the FDA's black box warning. All of this information is publicly available through the Katz family court records, and it appears that Elizabeth knew exactly what David was being prescribed. Honestly, this whole situation sounds fucked. Now, there is no justification for David's actions, and nobody knew what he was capable of doing in Jacksonville. But mental health is likely one of the most prudent areas to better understand in the judicial system. There is potentiality that all of this interference during David's childhood may have strongly influenced the actions that he committed in August of 2018. Following the Jacksonville Landing shooting, more than 50 lawsuits were filed, assigning blame for the deaths, wounds, and traumas. The 10 people who were shot and injured all reported a mix of physical and emotional damage, and many asked why and how such a tragedy was allowed to happen. Electronic Arts, the companies that managed Jacksonville Landing and provided security, owners of Chicago Pizza, the owners of Good Luck Have Fun Bar, and even the website operator where gamers had to register to compete, have all been sued in front of nine separate circuit court judges. Personal injury lawyers have argued that security procedures used at other events, such as concerts and football matches, make patrons pass through metal detectors, which would have been enough to stop David from committing his terrible actions. According to court documents and the crime scene photos, David had been carrying one firearm in his waistband and another in his backpack. It has also been questioned why David was able to purchase two firearms with such a history. But no matter which way you look at it, or whom you blame, the results are all the same. Two lives were lost, and many more were scarred. And Elijah Clayton and Taylor Robertson paid the ultimate price for a long and complex relationship between David and his mental health. It feels strange to say this over gaming, but both men died doing what they loved. They were professionals in their field, and had much more going on in their lives. And for their deaths to be so early, abrupt, and caught on livestream is tragic. I hope their families and friends find peace in the future. Hi there folks, and thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. Thank you so much for making it this far, and if you'd like to watch more videos by me, then you know what to do. Now please be sure to leave your thoughts on this case down below, like and subscribe to support the channel, and I'll see you again very soon for another video. But until we see each other again, please remember to look after each other and stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.